So that's my aim today. So I'm going to have the focus purely on chronic inflammation, what it is. And uh, so you're way better equipped to know what this is all about. So without further ado, welcome everyone. And thank you for being here. Thank you for investing your time. I really do mean it. I know, I know our time is valuable. So it means a lot that you're showing up and uh, you're, you're trusting me in, with this hour of your time. So thank you for being here, I really appreciate that. And today we're gonna to be talking about building resilience and what lies beneath. So last week we did talk about this, or I did talk about it a little bit, which is really about inflammation and how this impacts our immune system. So today I wanna to be talking about what it takes to have a strong immune system and also what compromises the immune system. So you're in a much better position to really know how to have a strong immune system and be resilient in these current times. So just for um, those of you who haven't been here yet, I just want to give you a very quick backstory about how I came across this information. And like many people in the holistic space, I do come with my own story. And um, in fact, I come with a couple of stories, one of which is my own challenge with eczema for the best part of 30 years. And when I was, when I was a kid particularly, I'd, I'd go to bed wearing these white gloves. I'd always use these um, steroid creams or moisturizers, or when it got really bad, I'd often take these antibiotics. My doctor would give me these antibiotics. And it would always come back. So it would never go away and just stay away. The, the eczema would always return. And, um, it wasn't until I was actually researching my father's condition when I realised that his condition was a result of the same underlying cause that caused my eczema all my life. And that is what we're going to be talking about today, chronic inflammation. So he suffered a stroke um, probably a decade ago now. And I remember him being diagnosed with this condition called chronic inflammation a few years prior to his stroke. And I remember him telling me this, we're in the family home in the kitchen, and he told me, and I didn't really know what it was because I was very new to health and fitness, um, but I knew it didn't sound good. And I, uh, I just, I was, it planted the seed, put it that way, it planted the seed because a few years later, after his stroke, I was like, I remember him being diagnosed with this thing, what's this thing all about? And I was reading books on health and wellness, and actually inflammation, interestingly. I just kept on seeing this word everywhere. I kept, I was watching these interviews, I was watching documentaries, and I kept on hearing this word, inflammation. I was like, what, what is this thing that I keep on hearing about? And it was during this research, really finding out about my father's stroke, what led to it, because I had this kind of inner knowing, it was in my heart, that his stroke was avoidable. I just... You, you know when you have this kind of inner knowing, it's like an innate intelligence. That's what was going on in me. And I thought, I want to find out what this whole thing is all about. So that's what kind of led me onto the train. The kind of, I went on a bit of a quest, if you like, a bit of an investigative quest. And that's when I found out all about chronic inflammation. And I realised that it really is behind so many conditions that we just grow to accept as part of life. And um, a lot of people take medications um, for conditions which they are, they believe they're genetic, but what's actually happening is they have these symptoms of this underlying condition. So that is why I'm on such a mission to help people to understand that they can actually reverse it. So I actually got rid of my, my own eczema very, very quickly by ultimately changing the environment in my body. Um, and diet was a major piece of that. But it's not just diet, as you, you may recollect, it's, it's, it's how we move, it's how we manage emotions, it's the mind-body connection, it's lots of things. But diet had a major role with me getting rid of it, and I was able to get rid of my own eczema uh, very quickly, then I helped other people get rid of eczema, and then I realised that the same strategies can be applied to so many different illnesses, which we often grow to accept as part of life. So things like type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes, asthma. Asthma is chronic inflammation of the bronchial tubes. So when we, you know, the, the standard of care with asthma, which is obviously very effective, the standard of care is to 
use a steroid inhaler, which is a localized is a localized steroid inhaler, which obviously allows us to breathe, which is a very incredible invention. The only thing is, it's not getting into the underlying cause of the asthma, which is chronic inflammation. So many people can reverse asthma by going on an anti-inflammatory protocol. I was going to say diet, but it's more than just always. It's more than diet normally, and people can get rid of it. So I've helped people reverse. Um, you know, various skin condition, conditions like eczema and psoriasis, acne, rosacea, IBS, type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, arthritis, gout, low testosterone in men. That's a, that is a symptom of chronic inflammation most of the time. And um, even Parkinson's, I've, uh, I helped someone reverse that a few years ago. And I'm now I'm now actually working with two people, uh, one of whom, thanks to Isaac actually, and um, to help them balance their body so this symptom goes away. So um, I'm really excited to be working with these people because I'm, I'm of the opinion now that the body can heal just about anything when it comes to chronic illness and chronic dis-ease. So what is inflammation? Ultimately, it is your immune system reacting to something that it perceives as an attack on the body. So it's a very healthy immune reaction. Without it, we would die. And we, you know, it's a very, very important thing. And um, we need to be grateful for it as a function. Uh, the only thing is, when it happens again and again and again and again and again, it becomes this chronic situation where the body starts to produce chronic symptoms. And I love this whiteboard, um, this phrase here. It says, if you don't recognize an ingredient, your body won't either. Hashtag inflammation. So that's obviously from a dietary standpoint. That's not, um, you know, that's not taking into account environmental toxins or, you know, how, you know, stress can, can trigger it as well. But from a dietary standpoint, if we put things in our body that the body just doesn't recognize, that can create an inflammatory response. So we want to be feeling we want to be feeling great, but we want to be consuming food that is nutritious. It's um, it's not just stuff. It has nutrients in it, so we can fuel the body at the cellular level. So mm -hmm. then we keep inflammation down. We keep the nutrients up, and we have a strong immune system. So the, the, probably the best way of remembering inflammation is it's, it's your body's reaction to some form of toxicity. And um, we live in a bit of a, we do live in a bit of a toxic environment now, and it, but it's not to sound, you know, um, all doom and gloom. There's lots we can do about it. We just need to be a bit more mindful about the food that we eat and the, what we're exposed to in the environment. And then we can create harmony in the body again. Every, all my work for the last five years has ultimately been about creating harmony in the body, giving the body what it needs, taking away what's harming it, and then we can, uh, we can create this harmonious environment, magic in the body, and a true state of vitality. My kind of one of my definitions of vitality is being free from any illness, free from any form of pain, chronic pain anyway, free from medications. You know, medications are very powerful. They're very, very useful, of course. It's just when we use them um, consistently, that's when we're kind of missing something about the body. And that's what I want to talk to you about now. So what else might trigger inflammation? The, some of the, the easiest things to relate to are things like chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, Anything that ends in asides is probably not going to be recognized by your immune system. So the immune system goes, whoa, what's that? And kind of it steps in to protect you. So um, it's alien. I like to think of these things as alien, alien intruders, alien invaders. They're alien because it, ultimately they don't come from nature and um, they're often man-made or they're, they're adapted. Um, you know, there's lots of things that men, man, men, that we are doing to produce, which is altering how the food is meant to be. And I'll come on to it in a second. 
But we want to be thinking as pure as nature um, allows us to live. And then we want, that's you know, a really good way of bringing inflammation down very quickly. So if, if we, for example, are eating fruits and vegetables covered in pesticides all the time, this can create a chronic in inflammatory response. Oh, is someone trying to say something? Oh, just a bit of background. Yeah, if you, could, if you guys can mute yourself, if you're, um, if you're able to, that'd be wonderful. Yes. In fact, I'm going to turn off my video. Let's just make sure. Okay. So, yeah, if, if we, um, yeah, if we're consuming things which are covered in these pesticides or herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, these kind of things, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes when I eat something, a form, a form of fruit, sometimes my lips will be all kind of sore, or, you know, strawberries, this used to happen before I knew about this, but strawberries and berries and tomatoes, if they're not organic, my lips can actually feel tingly, and it's, it's an indication that there's, there's often chemicals on the surface of these things. Now, it's not to say if you can't go organic, never eat a fruit or vegetable again, we just want to be, as, as much as money permits, to consume the purest of food money can buy so, um, so we have you know, the best kind of food. Um, there is argument to say that it's better to have fruits and vegetables that aren't organic uh, than not to have any at all. So that's, that's worth noting. So don't just stop eating vegetables because they're not organic. Still consume them. It's just if you can get organic, it's always the best organic is free from all of these pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, those kinds of things. So, um, another, another way of looking at inflammation is, um, is how the body communicates with us that we have it. And I like, the, I like, I like to use car analogies a lot, and, um, and I do that with the human body, and it, you'll hear me mentioned it a few times today. So imagine the warning lights in your car going off. You know, it might be an oil light or a water light or whatever it is, flat tire. And instead of going to a mechanic, let's say it's an oil light, and instead of going to a mechanic and getting the fuel, the oil checked or getting an oil change, imagine we went to, say, an electrician and they they kind of rewired the light, the dashboard, so the warning light wouldn't annoy you as much anymore. <laughs> That's kind of, kind of what's happening when we're taking medications for chronic illness. Because it's, the, the medications, they feel like they're effective because the symptoms go away, but they're not actually treating why the symptom is there in the first place. And many medications can actually cause the very thing we want to heal which is inflammation, and you know a lot of this takes place in the gut. So we want to be really mindful about um, long-term use of medication. Well, I want to be careful with how I say this because they absolutely do have their place. We just want to be mindful about long-term use of them because they can actually cause more harm than good. And it's often why people end up being on a whole cocktail of medications as they age because one drug creates a symptom for which another drug is then prescribed. Or rather, you t you're prescribed a, a drug to mitigate one symptom, to get rid of one symptom, but then a few years down the line, your body creates another symptom, partly because of the, the, the drug itself, but also because the underlying cause hasn't been addressed, so it's getting worse and worse. And it's as if you're just kind of masking symptoms but not getting to the cause. So this is why we live in a bit of a pill for a pill society, or pill for an ill. So the, I love this representation on the left. You've got the causes, you've got the problem, you've got the symptoms. The problem is the result. I mean, in a way, I don't want to call it a problem, but it's, it, because it's a healthy response. But it does become a problem when it's all the time. So that problem is chronic inflammation. Different causes create it, and then the body creates different symptoms. Think of different warning lights on your dashboard. It doesn't, you know, all of these symptoms are just the same, they're just a result of the same cause, just, but it's just dependent on your genetic code. And it kind of gets you, you're, you're 
gets you, but it kind of demonstrates itself at your weakest link. So for me, that's eczema. If I don't look after my body, I can't say my eczema is cured. If I don't look after my body, and if I don't pay attention to what I, you know, what I consume and my emotions and this kind of stuff, it can come back. I mean, for the most part, I'm, I'm totally free from it. But it's, um, if I were to just go back to my old ways, then it would come back. So it's just thinking of these different symptom names as purely symptom names. They are, they're not illnesses, they're not diseases, they're symptoms. And when we reframe it, if, if we stop thinking about illness and disease and instead think of it as chronic symptoms of chronic inflammation, then we go, okay, what's causing the inflammation? So behind every symptom is a problem and a cause. And when we have chronic inflammation, that also means we have a suppressed immune system. So we have this thing called COVID right now, and we keep on hearing those with a suppressed immune system are finding it the hardest to deal with it. So they've got something like um, diabetes or cancer or heart disease. But what they're not saying is that it's, the, it's this immune system reaction which is actually causing it. So we want to just put ourselves in the best position, put our best feet forward right now, in my opinion, to really look after our immune system. Could you just bear with me one second? There's the voices in my background. Okay, so um, the we want to yeah we want to be thinking of illness and disease as symptoms of something rather than a genetic illness or disease. So another analogy is you uh, here's the broken down engine and instead of going to the mechanic we take the car to a paint shop. I, I use this presentation particularly for my presentations on skin because I got I did have a focus specific to skin like eczema and acne, etc. And I likened the, the idea of instead of going to a mechanic, you take your car to a paint shop and you just kind of spray it down instead of really looking into the engine and finding out what's causing the, the skin to demonstrate these symptoms. And then again, the other alternative is we go to an electrician to, re to wire those um, the warning lights instead of going to a mechanic. So we want to be the mechanic. We want to be really going into the engine. And most of the time, that really means the gut. We want to be healing the gut, and uh, there's lots of ways to do that. So really, I'm, hope, I hope, I'm hoping to kind of hammer this home. Symptoms are messengers. They are our best friend. They are there for a reason. And if we ignore them, and if we take medications, it's kind of missing the point about why the body presents them. So I'm on such a mission to help people to um, be more aware of this because it's, it's quite a new way of looking at it. You know, it's, I'm not obviously the only person in holistic health who's doing it, but it's just, um, you know, we're not brought up with this mentality because of what we consider as, um, you know, the med medicine industry. So um, we want to be reminding ourselves how powerful the body is and healing itself and kind of allowing the body to communicate with us and then taking action. So, the, uh, there it is. It's basically symptoms of inflammation. That's what we have. So, as a recap, we have the immune system protecting you. You've got causes, and the causes typically are two main categories. We have toxins and we have trauma. Uh, trauma is uh, also considered, or another word might be, trapped emotions. And uh, this is a big thing right now, and, and uh, well, right now it's, it's a big thing anyway. And it's, this is one of the main focuses I help people with, actually, because we actually store emotions in the body. There's a slogan that says, the organs weep the tears, the eyes never shed. And what that means is we actually store these emotions in the body, like electromagnetic bundles of energy. We are these electromagnetic beings, and these emotions can get stored in the body, and they actually prevent the flow of electricity, actually, but I'm not going to go into that in this particular 
presentation. I've done that in the last two presentations, actually, but I wanted to keep this one more simple. But if you can just think of emotions and chronic stress um, causing an inflammatory response, that's all we need to know. And um, the more at calm we're at, a place of calm, if we're in a place of calm, even in stressful situations, that really helps to keep um, inflammation down. And that's obviously, a, that's obviously a training in itself. So toxins and trauma cause all these different types of symptoms uh, because they've created this inflammatory effect. So when we get to the cause, we can then become free from these symptoms. So it really is uh, the underlying cause. It's not the root cause because th there's a cause behind the cause, if you like. But inflammation is like the underlying condition behind all of these different challenges. Cardiovascular diseases means heart attacks and strokes. Bone muscular skeletal diseases. A lot of people, but their bones become brittle. And you know the likes of osteoporosis, there's always inflammation present when there's osteoporosis. Chronic inflammatory diseases, uh, of which there are many, neurological, so Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, even depression as well. In about a third of cases of depression, it's linked with chronic inflammation of the brain. It's even called chronic inflammation of the brain because there's a very distinct gut-brain link. If you have inflammation in the gut, that's gonna have a knock-on effect on your brain health. Whereas if you have a nice, clean, harmonious gut, the opposite's gonna be true. You're gonna be feeling vital and energized, great mental clarity. You've probably heard of brain fog. That's often because of chronic inflammation. So diabetic complications, that means pre-diabetes, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is typically called a dietary disease. It's normally the one that people develop in life. Um, type 1 you can also develop in life as well, but that's normally an autoimmune dis-ease when it's developed in life. And that's normally a result of leaky gut as a result of chronic inflammation, as a result of lots of different things. So... Type 2 diabetes is much easier to reverse than type 1, but you can actually reverse type 1. So um, it's just much harder. So metabolic disorder complications and most forms of cancer start with chronic inflammation. With cancer, most people um, don't realise that it takes many, 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 many years for cancer to develop. And sometimes there are reports for a tumour to be detectable. It's 10 years. And, um, you know, if, it's, if it takes that long, there's normally... Not always, but normally time to address the, the body from the inside out to allow the body to naturally heal and allow the cancer to go. Um, I'm a massive uh, believer of this and I've read some amazing books on people reversing stage four cancer and what it took to do it without any medical intervention. I've, I've developed this weird fascination of people reversing uh, quote unquote incurable illnesses according to Western medicine because they are found, they're finding out all this information themselves about how to heal the body. And um, in many cases, it's, uh, it's very, very possible to do this completely holistically, just by understanding what cancer is and um, think of it you know, as, a, as a reaction to excessive toxicity in the body, ultimately. We want to bring down the toxicity, load up the immune system, and amazing things can happen. And again, food is just one part of that. There's many different pillars of... I call them vitality. So, um, when we have chronic inflammation, we have a suppressed immune system because your body's already protecting you. Imagine, imagine you know, you've got these chronic symptoms. I'll use me as an example. If I've got really bad eczema, I've got it all over, imagine, I don't, but imagine it had it all over my body. That's my immune system um, reacting. It's the symptom of my immune system reacting to current levels of toxicity in the body. So what then happens if there's a new bug and virus in town? If my body's already dealing with toxicity in some level, whether it's physical toxicity or emotional or mental toxicity, if it's already dealing with that, it doesn't have as much energy to protect you from the new, the new insult on the body. I'll give a quick example. I went to a Tony Robbins event in the end of, at the end of 2015. I may have met, done this one before, actually, but forgive me for those of you who have heard it. Um, at the end of 2015, and there was, I was warned by a fellow metal friend, actually, Stefan Spencer. He said, careful, 
people get ill when they go to this, so look after your, immu your immune system. And I thought, okay, that seems like pretty good advice. And I, I was already anti, you know, living an anti-inflammatory life anyway, but I just, um, I really kind of ramped it up. I really upped my vitamin C. I was vegetable juicing every single day. I was taking zinc. I was, um, you know, I wasn't having any dairy or, you know, gluten or um, some of the primary culprits for inflammation for many, many people. Not for everyone, but for many, for me, that they, they are culprits. And, you know, I was having salads every day. I wasn't having the general hotel food. I was bringing my own stuff, my own nutrition bars and stuff. And I felt amazing all week and I didn't get ill. And there were 2,700 people there. And there was a group afterwards, huge Facebook group. And for, for as far as I could see, everyone was complaining about being sick, including people in my much smaller group of, you know, I think there were about 100 people. Everyone was sick and I wasn't. And there's only one other person I saw. I mean, there's probably other people, but the only one other person I saw did the same as me and she didn't get sick either nutritionist and really looking after what she ate every day and her immune system protected her from whatever was going around. Like we've always got bugs and viruses in the body. They're, they're always there. We always have pathogens. We always have these things happening in the body all the time. It's just a matter of whether our immune system is strong or not to protect us from a, a potential threat, whether it's a bug or a virus or whatever it is. So I hope that's clear. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I didn't give that example to kind of sh show off and go, hey, look at me, how cool. I just want to share that example because when the immune system is strong, we are in so much better stead to protect ourselves. And that's why many people, I, I interviewed Eric Edmeads on, um, on, on my podcast about a month ago after he actually presented at Metal. And uh, he gave a statistic and I think it's between 60 and 70% he quoted, people are asymptomatic when they have COVID. So their body doesn't even show any symptoms. 60 to 70%. Tony Robbins did a review. He, he interviewed a number of doctors. And he quoted 98% of people, he, he's pretty well connected and he's you know, talking to some brilliant minds in this space. He said 98% of people are either asymptomatic or they have very mild symptoms. So in only 2% of people who get it, they have a reaction. And I think it's something like less than 0.2% of people. That's basically our risk for, you know, something severe happening. So we have a very, very, very low risk to this if we look after our body. I just see a hand go up. Vitamin D, yes, uh, Harry, absolutely. Um, you know, since, what, since you've said that, I'll give you a quick example about something I shared in the community, the metal community recently. One of my friends um, had very bad symptoms of COVID, respiratory, respiratory symptoms, and we FaceTimed, and she was really struggling to breathe. And I said, hey, I've uh, heard in my circle that vitamin C IV is really effective for getting rid of these symptoms. Um, you know, it's, the, the symptoms are basically respiratory. It's, it's as if the cells can't get enough oxygen as well. So it's not necessarily the lungs at fault. It's that the cells aren't getting enough oxygen, which is why the going on the ventilator is, has a pretty poor outcome, actually. It's, it's the cells under-oxygenated. It's not the lungs not working, if that makes any sense. This is my understanding, by the way. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical professional. My understanding is it's the cells under oxygenated. It's like they can't get enough oxygen into the cells. So why does that happen? Because of some kind of conflict, you know, insult onto the body. So she was really struggling. And I said, I suggested that she looked into vitamin C IV or vitamin C IV. And I shared with her a reference uh, from Dr. McCullough. I found this article on vitamin C IV and also ozone therapy. And two days later, she called me and she said, Neil, I'm totally better. You've saved my life. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, wow, that's awesome. I mean, I obviously didn't save her life. I just recommended her to read an article. She took action and uh, she, she obviously did it herself. Um, but when, you know, the body is so strong when we look after it, 
And um, I have heard that vitamin C is one of the, it sounds so simple, but IV vitamin C is mega dosage straight into your veins. And um, it doesn't have to go via the, you know, the digest digestive tract. Some people find it hard to absorb certain nutrients. So this goes straight into the veins. And for her, it was remarkably effective. Ozone therapy, it's getting so much oxygen into your veins um, that you can, you know, become much more resilient. So there's lots of incredibly effective natural ways to protect ourselves from this latest thing. And, um, you know, one of those is to keep inflammation right down and make sure the body's strong. Um, so she's very grateful for that. And she then started sharing with me articles or news bulletins on naturopathic doctors being targeted by the FDA for making claims about helping people with COVID with intravenous therapy, meaning vitamin C and zinc and D and whatever else. Um, you know, D is we get from the sunlight predominantly, but you can take it as a supplement as well. But um, for some reason that's happening. So I interviewed a naturopathic doctor about, a, well, a few days later actually, so that's on my podcast as well, about people, you know, how she's helping people with these symptoms, but she can't make any claims. All she can say is, this is good for the immune system. She can't make any claims about COVID, nothing like that. So. I just want to share that with you. Ultimately, everything's about doing our own research into this stuff. I just want to kind of present that to you so you're, at least you have that knowledge so you can share it with those you love, you care about, and you know, check out some of the functional medicine doctors talking about it. It's very real, but they, no one can make any claims. So thank you for saying that, Harry. Vitamin C definitely, definitely is very important. Sorry, vitamin D, very, very important. And grounding, you know, I've talked about grounding before, just walking around bare feet and sleeping with grounded sheets, grounding sheets is incredible. It's very good for the electrical systems. So next part, what else might your, your human body not recognize? And um, I just thought I'd bring this in here because it's quite an interesting one. An important question to ask is, am I a human or a baby cow? For most of my life, I drank breakfast uh, for, for breakfast, I'd have milk with my cereal and lots of cheese and um, it was really, I, I didn't think there's anything wrong with it because I was told it's good for your bones, calcium gives you strong bones. Anyway, one of the things I have found to be quite inflammatory for many, many people, I can't say 100% of people, but lots of people find cow's milk inflammatory. And when we think about it, um, you know, if... if if one were to find out that cow's milk is inflammatory and, you know, dairy as well, there are some forms of dairy that some people seem to be okay with. I have butter, for example, with, there's no casein or lactose, but let's just take the idea of dairy for a second. If we think to ourselves, why, why might cow's milk be inflammatory? And then we just think, hang on, what, what is it designed for? What, what is cow's milk designed for? So you might th say, am I a human or a baby cow? So there's a cow, there's a baby cow, also known as a calf, and this is a baby. So this is a human baby, and then this is a baby cow. They don't look very much like one another at all. They've both got eyes, that's about it. There's a baby again, and that's a fully grown cow. Very, very dissimilar, really not many similarities at all. So the point I'm trying to make is, you've probably got it, if, if, um, if we're consuming milk specifically designed for baby cows to grow fast, to give them this massive boost in life, that's what, you know, as human babies, human beings, we drink milk from our mother's breast to give us this best boost in life, to, to take all the right nutrients, micronutrients, macronutrients, amino acids and hormones for us, these baby human beings, to grow fast. The same is true for cows and baby cows. They, they drink this milk specifically designed for baby cows to grow fast. All those nutri nutrients and proteins and hormones for these baby cows to grow fast. And we tend to be put on dairy milk soon after we've been weaned off our mother's breast remembering to get the right mammal. So we are often taken straight from breast to udder, which is little 
utterly ridiculous, if you may think about it, but zoom out a little bit. Um, that used to be a title for my slide, actually, utterly ridiculous. Um, we get calcium from vegetables. We get calcium from, many, from nuts and all sorts of other sources. Yes, it is in milk, but it's actually not that bioavailable in milk. And um, we can get it from many, many other sources. Uh, the thing with milk is uh, cow's milk. It has lactose, which is the sugar in cow's milk. And, lact and um, what, something interesting happens with human beings after they are weaned off their mother's breast. It's actually a normal biological re reaction. I'm sorry, sorry, it's not a reaction. It's a process. It's a normal biological process for the human body to lose the enzyme called lactase, which breaks down the lactose, which is the sugar, in our mother's milk. So because we are weaned off that milk after however long, six months, a year, maybe longer, um, we don't need it anymore. So that's why most people are actually lactose intolerant. Uh, different figures for, depending on where you read, but some report around 70 to 80 percent of the population is lactose intolerant. And it's not actually that weird when you think about it, because we're not meant to be drinking this milk, certainly from another mammal, after we are weaned off our own mother's breast. And it is a bit weird when we think about it. It's, it's, al it's almost more weird to be tolerant to it, because that means that we've kept this enzyme, which we're not meant to have. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And um, the, the more we think about the things that we do, even though that even if they're social norms and societal norms, there is some stuff that we do that's just quite weird. <laughs> and one of them is drinking cow's milk. Um, and of course, that means cheese as well. Um, if I, I went back to um, my family's home for Christmas a few years ago, and we had loads of cheese, and I just thought, you know what, I'm with my family, I'm just going to let my bar down and uh, my guard down. And I, I, honestly, within the next day, my skin was terrible. And I was like, yes, that's why I'm not meant to be eating cheese. So um, it's, it's very, everybody is different. So it's not the same for every single person, but a lot of people can benefit from taking out cow's milk. So a quick reminder, um, we are made up of trillions of cells. If, if this is new to you, for newcomers, we are made up of 50 trillion cells, and every single one of our cells behaves like a biological mini-me. And they, they have exactly the same functions as we do as humans. And every one of these cells makes up a muscle, or bone, or joint, or ligament, or organ, or anything in the body. We are made up of cells. So they behave like a biological mini-me. And, you know, functions might be hormonal functions, endocrine, digestive, um, lymphatic. It's all the same. Lymphatic's like your waste disposal unit. You know, I'll come on to that in a second. And Bruce Lipton, cell biologist, said, in reality, a cell is a biological mini-me compared to a human body. A cell has every biological system that you have. And I'm bringing this in here just as a quick reminder because it's, I like to simplify things as much as I can. And um, it's actually something I'm told I'm quite good at. And I'm hoping this has been useful and simple for you. So when we think of what the body needs at the cellular level, we need oxygen. Number one, we need oxygen. And without it, we become under-oxygenated. And this is why physical activity is very, very good. And it, you know, any kind of activity. It could be walking. It can be anything dancing, playing bowls, <laughs> whatever it is. But just being active is very important to get oxygen pumping around the body. Um, but interestingly, exercise isn't the only way that the body gets oxygen. Or rather, lack of, act lack of physical activity isn't the only reason why cells become under-oxygenated. But we do want to make sure we are active. And we want to be making sure that our cells get a number one fuel. Number two is water. We want to be consuming the purest of water money can buy. And, um, you know, sometimes we drink water from the taps and it's loaded with contaminants. 
um, trace elements of the female contraceptive pill, for example, that I've mentioned a few times to you guys, is a major reason why guys' testosterone levels start to drop off. Because we've got this, hot, this female contraceptive pill in our water systems now. Water systems can't basically get extracted. That's what we're finding. And there are, there are lakes and rivers in the UK, Florida, various countries around the world where marine life is feminizing, like male fish are growing eggs in lakes and rivers. I've even talked about this before, but alligator penises are shrinking. I did this presentation of metal in December and you know, don't ask me why I know that, but they are, and that's the information that I came across, but that's happening. And why, do, why should we care about that? Well, if that's happening to marine life and, um, you know, fish, you know, why are male fish growing eggs? Why are they feminizing? And how can that possibly impact us? We need to think about the water that we drink. We want to be drinking the purest of water that doesn't have contaminants in it. And um, we want to have oxygenated water as well. And we want to have energized water. Water, there's a, water could, I could do a presentation for an hour or a day on water. Um, but we want to be just consuming the best water we can get our hands on. So this one's really the main slide here because we've talked about nutrients today mainly. We want to be thinking of the third fuel as nutrients. And nutrients really, a lot of that is what we're putting in our body by the way of food. But also light is a nutrient and Harry mentioned vitamin D earlier. That's a nutrient. Sunlight is a nutrient. So we want to be getting so much sunlight, oh sorry, we want to be getting sufficient sunlight. We don't want to be overdoing it, but we want to be getting sufficient sunlight to really nourish ourselves. And, uh, and then again, thinking about what is real and what is not. We want to be having the purest of food, vegetables, you know, that money can buy. Vegetable juicing, for example, is so effective to help people reduce inflammation and ramp up their immune systems. Um, we want to be thinking pure food, organic and majority plant-based whenever we can, and free from inflammatory and toxic types. So, we've, you know, I've talked about one of them as being dairy. So um, many people can benefit just from that one change. But other things like, you know, sugar, for example, is too much of that is not a good thing. And I'm talking refined sugar, a little bit of fruit, whole fruit should be fine. So let thy medicine, like, sorry, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. That's Hippocrates. And the food you eat can either be the safest and the most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. That's uh, Anne Wigmore. So we can, we can change a lot by changing what we eat. So I mentioned earlier about the gut and, you know, the gut is like the engine in the car. And when we get in there, or <laughs> get in there, when we give it some love, when we give our gut some love, whether it's what we're eating or, you know, moving, oxygenating, uh, emotions, um, looking at where other toxins might be coming from. Other toxins, by the way, might be something like uh, electromagnetic radiation, a big one right now. I've been in the EMF space for the last couple of years, particularly with the launch of 5G. We need to understand how and protect ourselves from the effects of radiation from our cell phones. And I shared last week that my own phone caused my immune system to crash. And uh, I won't go into that now, but it's all about the body electric. So we want to be really thinking about um, everything. The, the, the gut is like the engine for the body. So whatever we do, whatever we consume, how we, how we move, how we manage our emotions, all of that impacts our gut health. So when we take care of the gut, it will take care of you. Waste disposal is a big one. Um, this is like the, the fourth quote-unquote fuel for our cells. Water, sorry, oxygen, water, nutrients. And the final one is to be able to get rid of waste. Just by breathing, we get rid of waste. But the, the lymphatic system is something I want to share quickly for those of you who are not aware. It's like the waste disposal part of the immune system. And it only works effectively when the body is active. So sedentary lives, we might have heard that sitting is the new smoking. Um, it's so true because when we're not getting enough um, movement, the lymphatic system doesn't work very well. It requires the body to move. It requires 
physical activity and it requires to warm up ever so slightly because of the fluid that the lymph fluid is and you know we expel it from various parts of our body like under our arms we all know <laughs> that happens and you know throughout through pores in our skin all over we we by the way this is one reason why not to use antiperspirant deodorant because it's like putting a cork in your exhaust pipe you want to allow it to go but also just if you're worried about smelling, get something like activated charcoal. It's amazing, one of my favorite things. You, you, you're allowed to sweat, <laughs> allowed. <laughs> you're given permission to sweat. It allows you to sweat and not smell. Activated charcoal. We wanna be allowing the exhaust systems in our body to work um, because otherwise toxins build up. Dead cells, dead cancer cells. We're, we've all got cancer cells in us all the time. It's just a matter of whether they develop into anything that's going to, you know, affect us. So we want those to be able to be exported out of the body. Um, and again, just gentle exercise. Yoga is one of my absolute favourites for this. So powerful for the body. Um, but yeah, all of these different organs or systems here on the right are ways to get rid of dead um, products and waste and toxins. So you've got the blood, you've got the lymph, you've got the liver gallbladder, kidneys, intestines, all of that gets rid of stuff. But the main one I want to draw your attention to is the lymphatic system because, yeah, sedentary lives isn't doing people any favours. And then the final part of this is looking after our thoughts and our emotions. So this is like the governor for ourselves, how we think and how we feel on a day-to-day -day basis, on an hourly basis, on a minute basis is, is impacting our biology. And um, it's, this is a where a lot of my focus for my work is going now. It's how our thoughts and beliefs are the language of the mind. Feelings and emotions are the language of the body. Um, what actually happens is a thought or a belief triggers an emotion, which triggers a cascade of chemicals and hormones in the body and your own pharmacy. This is how the placebo effect works, and this is how the opposite of the placebo effect works, which is called the nocebo effect. So the nocebo effect is the negative version of placebo, which shows what the mind can do if we believe certain things, and if we believe we have an incurable illness, for example, that's not a good thing. So we wanna be flipping the nocebo whenever we can, catching ourselves if we're ever thinking negatively about our health, or if we start repeating the same thoughts and emotions, etc., can literally trigger the nocebo effect. So flip the nocebo, think about the placebo, and uh, we can create harmony in the body again. So I always work across these four pillars. The physical, mental, emotional, and the spiritual. And uh, we can create real magic in the body when we have harmony across these four pillars. I've just seen someone raise a hand. Ah, oh, James saying he'd like to stay towards the end for the rest. Um, sorry to see you go. There will be a re replay, yes. I think he's gone. So that is... Um, that is the end of this presentation, everyone. And I'm now going to turn my video back on. And make it interactive. So, who has something they'd like to raise? Hi, Neil. This is Michael. Hey, Michael. Great presentation. I really, really enjoyed it and love your work. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Um, so, a few questions, but what was that quote you read for Ann Wigmore? The food you eat can either be the most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. Wow. I, uh, I got her book right here. Oh, no way. Like, Brilliant. Cool. The Hippocrates Diet. Love it. Yeah. Um, so, here's a question um, around milk and meat. So, I've been following a yoga training and trying to reduce my meat consumption. And, first of all, I'm all with you on the dairy. But, you know, in some of the ancient traditions, they promote vegetarianism, but, you know, allow eating dairy. So, you know, if you had to pick, like, eliminating meat but still eating dairy. Can you speak a little bit? I would, um, I would take the dairy out and keep the meat in, personally. 
Um, I'm a fan of paleo, which basically means uh, I think it's a very anti-inflammatory way of living. And I've helped people, a lot of people, reverse illness with a paleo diet. So meaning you take the dairy out, you can keep the meat, you can keep the fish, you can keep the eggs if you're not intolerant to eggs. Some people are intolerant to eggs, but many people aren't. I live on them. I've got one here, in fact. <laughs> um, that's weird. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm actually a fan of... I, I don't think meat's the main problem. I think too much of it is unnecessary. Um, even a little bit of red meat every now and again, I don't think is such a bad thing. So, I'd say bring it down, but... If I were to pick between them, I would say lose the dairy, keep the meat. Interesting. Okay, and I've been um, struggling with HPV for a while, planter's warts. Yeah. And I'm hearing it's really a lot of it is inflammation, so just taking out the things that cause inflammation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, to get rid of HPV itself requires something much more uh, bespoke, I would say, than this. Uh, but definitely anything in the body, basically inflammation in the body makes anything worse. So whilst inflammation won't get rid of the, the sorry, both, whilst getting rid of inflammation won't get rid of the HPV, it's going to be very effective at reducing symptoms of the HPV. But you can get rid of you can get rid of HPV, and I know people have done it. And yeah, this this darn you know space shuttle we all carry around. Yes. Yeah. I I um I've gone so far as to turn off the main power breaker in my home in Colorado, and I've lived without any cell service, without any EMFs. And wow. uh, I have noticed a little difference. Um, you know, over a few days, but now I'm here in LA and, you know, I try and turn my phone in airplane mode yeah. when I sleep. I try not to, you know, have it by my head all the day. Absolutely. Really important. Um, um, you had a incident, but can you just speak a little bit more into the phones? Sure. Um, so I, I used to hold my phone here and it, you're, I was emitting, obviously, the radiation to that side of my face. And what happened was I got a cold. It was in 2017. I was in L.A. living a very healthy life. And I got a cold, and I couldn't get rid of it for about, like, a month. I still had a cold. And I was like, what is going on? I never get sick. Why can't I get rid of this cold? So I went to go and see a kinesiologist, and he muscle-tested me. And he found out that... Or well, he told me that three teeth here had depolarized my, become depolarized. What that meant was that these teeth had flipped polarity because our teeth are like circuit breakers in the body. Every electrical system passes through our teeth. And we have six different main circuits with different organs on different circuits. This is, by the way, why I think we can reverse engineer any illness because you can find out which circuits are compromised with electrical equipment and find out how to get it firing again to get the voltage back up again. So what happened with me is three teeth. He was very specific with the teeth. They had become depolarized, and he told me these are connected to my immune system, basically my gut. 70 to 80% of the immune system is like the large intestine. And he used lasers on my teeth to change the polarity again. And he also shone the lasers on my car. He shone, he, he like directed the lasers on my phone. It was really weird, because this is all brand new to me. Uh, you know, back in 2017, the electrical body stuff was quite new. So he said, this is what's happened. And he just used, la he used lasers, and then my immune system was back to normal within a few days. And my cold went away. So he says this is happening with so many people in their cell phones because they're like this. You've got the radiation right next to your face. When I'm on the phone now, I'm, I'm normally like this at least. Or I have my air tube 
earphones, which uh, they don't even allow the electricity to come up the wire, so that there's air in between. Two seconds. Um, so I use these earphones, which they basically stop the electricity coming from the phone into my ears. So, and by the way, those Apple um, iPhone, what are they called? AirPods, worst invention ever. <laughs> um, we don't, we don't want to be having Bluetooth devices in our ear. There's not even any skull to protect us. Um, so a lot of people, in fact, they've shown studies of the, the radiation from those ear pods as if you've got your head against a microwave like this. That's how many, how intense the EMFs are from those, uh, those Apple Bluetooth, you know the ones I'm talking about. So um, yeah, that's, that's what happened with my immune system and that's what got me into body electric. Oh, thanks. Neil, I have a, I have a question uh, in regards to milk. So, so many people in tradition and cultures go back to centuries where they consume dairy and cheese, uh, and it's always been in a diet. When you say that, uh, you know, uh, would you say that having it in the diet for so so long uh, makes their body more adaptable to the, uh, you know, to the ingredients of the milk? Yes. And then when you say, uh, yeah. That out of you, that out of your system to where it would make you more susceptible to uh, inflammation if you reintroduced it? Well, you've raised two really good points because the, the body definitely does become more adaptive. It adapts to these things. However, when, which is, that, that's how intelligent the body is. However, when we take these things out, the body cleans out and then when they're reintroduced, that's when we experience symptoms. So an elimination diet, for example, if someone's got something like, I don't know, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or something which is really quite severe, an elimination diet is often necessary to just clean out the body completely and then you start to reintroduce things to see what the body likes and doesn't like. And once the body is cleaned out, it tells you very quickly. Like if I have gluten now, which is another, you know, one of these things for many people, uh, culprits. If I have gluten, I normally get bloated. And depending, of course, on the quality of the grain. If you're, in, if you're in Italy and you have the purest of grain that money can buy, and it's from these ancient, pure sources, you might be fine, or I might be fine. But sometimes, for the most part in America, it's gone through mutagenesis and it's been messed with by man, it's, it's all these different processes have changed. I don't want to get, I've gone off on a tangent. Coming back to your original question, culture and um, how we've been brought up is a big thing. And there's a woman called Paleo Boss Lady and I met her in the Bulletproof Cafe in Santa Monica and we had this very discussion because she has Italian roots. So brought up on pasta and pizza and she reversed her multiple sclerosis by taking out all the grains. And she did a talk, a TED talk, on how your culture affects the body. So whilst many people might be absolutely fine, if someone were to get something like multiple sclerosis, it's definitely worth paying attention to things that have become a social norm, which aren't so much a biological norm or looking at what's happened to the food chain for it to become bastardized. <laughs> you know, in, in America, they've bastardized a lot of food. By the way, I love America and I spent a lot of my time there. That's not the point of this. But something has been done to our food chain in America. And, you know, gluten, soy, um, cottonseed, um, corn, you know, they've been messed with and a lot of people can benefit from just taking them out and just going pure again. So, yeah, in terms of social and cultural upbringings, I can definitely see where the friction comes to change. 
But if someone has a really inflammatory condition, it's definitely worth looking into. I've got, I've got Italian friends who are very stubborn. And I'm like, well, do you, do you, wanna, do you want your arthritis or do you want to continue to eat the pasta? I mean, it's, it's up to you. I mean, do you want to heal or continue to eat pasta? So it, it is a good question because it can create resistance in people. 